Good morning. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. <clears throat> Stop it. <clears throat> I miss you guys too. Miss you guys a lot. All right, okay. <clears throat> All right. Jesus is good and awesome. So, <clears throat> so um, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Emmett. Had to make sure I said that. <clears throat> Um, it is a, a delight and a joy and an unsuspected privilege to be here with you guys this morning to share with you from God's Word. And the circumstances were less than ideal. The reason that I'm here in Idaho is because my grandfather passed away last Saturday. And so my dad, miraculously, and my grandmother asked me to do the funeral, which, you know, as a pastor, there are many, many things that I love about my job, but that is not one of them. And that was not something that I wanted to do, but when I realized I wasn't going to tell my dad and my grandma no, and so when I realized I was coming, I thought, well, the silver lining is, is that I'll do, this, uh, do the funeral on Saturday, and then I can come to Emmett for church on Sunday and see all of you people that we love so much and that we've missed so much, and so I called Pastor Mike kind of excited because I was like, you know, my grandpa died, but, but I'm going to be in town. I'll, I'll be able to come see you guys, and he goes, well, that sucks. I'm like, why? <laughs> we're going to be in Rome. I'm like, no. I was like, that cannot be happening. I was like, that is just impossible that that's what's going on. And, and he says, well, why don't you come in? I said, well, I'm going to try to get a flight in on Thursday. It's really last notice. It's going to be red eye. And he's like, well, you should try to come in on Wednesday because we're leaving on Thursday. And I'm like, well, I guess I could try to get a flight on Wednesday. It might be difficult. And he goes, yeah, 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 get a flight on Wednesday. And if you guys know Pastor Mike, you know how this conversation went. And he goes, and since you're going to be in town, you might as well teach. I'm like, <laughs> Mike, I'm doing my grandpa's funeral on Saturday in Chalice. I won't be able to get back in time for a Saturday night, and I'm not going to be able to study. I'm not going to be in the mind frame. He's like, well, what time's the funeral on Saturday? I was like, it's at 1. He goes, oh, you can be back in time. I'm like, I'm like all right, you know what? Just book me. I, and so I hung up the phone, and my wife looks at me, and she goes, what just happened? I'm like, I don't really know what happened. So, <clears throat> But anyway, here I am, and I'm glad that I'm here with you guys this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in the Gospel of John this morning in chapter 5. And the title of today's message is, Do You Want It? And the one day I had with Pastor Mike, he managed to give me some grief about the title of the message. Because he's like, what does that mean? I'm like, listen, when you're in Homer, Alaska, you've got to come up with titles for your message that grab people's attention because they just don't care. So, I mean, a couple weeks ago, I had a message titled Mystery Meat. Got some people's attention. <laughs> so... But this title came about from when I was a kid, I grew up and I played a number of different sports. I played football and basketball, and I was in track and field. I wrestled, or as they say in Chalice, I wrestled. Um, I played a little baseball, and to my everlasting shame, I even have played a little soccer. <laughs> Pointless sport. <laughs> but I say all that to say I've had a lot of coaching in my life, okay? And I've heard a lot of coach speak, and any of you who've been in athletics or have had coaching know what coach speak is, right? It's all these motivational themes that, it doesn't matter what sport you're in, they, they cross all platforms, and they never really answer a question, they just throw out their coachisms to you. And one of the themes that I've heard repeated more times than I can count as I was growing up and playing different sports is being encouraged by my coaches that if I wanted to succeed on the field or the court or the mat, I had to want it. I had to, and they'd scream it like a drill sergeant as you're doing laps or push-ups or hitting the guy. You got to want it, Ernest. Do you want it? You got it. You know, and they'd just scream that at you. You're just like, I, I, I don't know if I want it. You know? And then specifically, they'd say, do you want it more than the other guy, right? Because then on game day, it's like, we want it more than them. And we're like, do we want it more than them? You know, but that was the whole thing. Do you want it? It was all about desire. And, you know, the, I think the theme is legitimate because... No matter how good your coach is, no matter how many useful skills they can teach you, no matter how many plays they come up with that put you in position to win, if you don't care, the desire to try and to win, it's not going to translate onto the field. So it comes down to desire. <laughs> and desire is a funny thing. The longer I live, the more I've discovered that normally and usually for people, the things that we desire the most usually end up becoming a reality. Because we base all of our thoughts and decisions and actions on obtaining or achieving the things that we desire most in this life. I got a small taste of this a couple weeks ago in my own home. My little girl, Sophia, 
has wanted a puppy for about a year and a half now. And she has all these little puppy stuffed animals, and she calls them her lovies. And if she gets a, a stuffed animal moose or a stuffed animal seal, those go to the little sister, and she keeps all her puppy collection. And don't you dare have one of her puppies. So she has taken to the last four or five months, putting her little puppies on a leash and dragging them through the house, going on little puppy walks. And she'll be like, Daddy, look at my puppy. Isn't he cute? Oh, I wish he was real. <laughs> And so my wife has begun suggesting that our little girl needs a puppy. But you guys would have been proud of me because I was resolute. It's like, we do not need another animal. We have four already. We cannot take care. And anybody who has boys knows what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> I was not going to break in that regard at all. And so <laughs> my wife comes to pick me up from work one night. And the kids are literally bouncing out of their seats. And my little girl, Sophia, has a face-cracking grin that I, I know right away, like, what's going on? And Caleb's like, Dad, you're not going to believe the surprise we have for you at home. And I look at my wife, and she's not even looking at me. She's just like looking straight ahead. <laughs> what's going on here? And so we get about half a mile down the road, and my littlest girl, Nevaeh, goes, Dad, you meet my puppy. And I'm like, I thought stuffed animal. I'm like, oh, you got a new puppy? Oh, honey, that's sweet. And Caleb goes, Dang it, Nebe, you ruined the surprise. And I'm like, I look at Kathy, and again, she's just straight ahead, not looking at me. I'm like, you did not get a dog without consulting me. She's like, now listen, this is what happened. We went down to the animal shelter. I didn't make a decision. We went to the animal shelter. They have this policy. You can take a puppy home for a week, and if you don't like it, it doesn't work back. Work out, you can take it back. And I told the kids, it was up to you, that we weren't keeping it. It was up to you. And I'm like, I'm like oh, OK. And how long did it take for my little girls to fall in love with said puppy? She goes, about 30 seconds. I'm like, yeah. So I'm going to be the dad that says, take the puppy back and win worst dad of the eternity award. So we have a new dog. <clears throat> my wife's punishment is I told her I was throwing her under the bus for this message. So there you go. <clears throat> but my little girl's desire became a reality. And actually, the dog is pretty cool. He's a little miniature greyhound. Um, the first day, like, we just, he wouldn't come near me because he knew I despised his existence. <laughs> but then he came up, he crawled up in my lap, and now he actually loves me the most. I don't know how that happened, but he sleeps all day, and so Nevaeh has nicknamed him, he, we called him Zeus, but um, I don't know why, don't ask, but Nevaeh nicknamed him Snooze, so <laughs> that's his name. But this morning in John chapter 5, we're going to be discovering that our desire plays a huge role in the kind of relationship that we can have with Jesus. And so let's take a look at our verses this morning, starting in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which, in, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already, already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool, and the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They, then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Father, as we get into your word this morning, I pray that you would apply your word to our hearts powerfully this morning, that, Lord, we would let you do the work that you need to do in each of us, Lord. 
I believe with all my heart that you have something specific and intentional for every person here this morning, including me. And I pray, Lord, that we would let it have its full impact in each of us. We love you and we praise you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we see here in John chapter 5, this is coming on the heels of all the drama that went down in John chapter 4. And if you have time, you guys should check it out because the other four chapters are pretty cool. So, uh, but in John chapter 4, we see Jesus having left Jerusalem in chapter 2 and 3. He goes to Samaria intentionally, and he's got a, a divine appointment with this woman who's going to be at a well. And th through this interaction, this woman, this woman of ill repute, this woman who'd lived a life of sin, she ends up becoming converted, and through her interaction with Jesus, the entire village is saved. Pretty awesome stuff. And after that, Jesus leaves Samaria, and he goes into his own home country for a time, back to Cana, where he turned water to wine, and he hangs out there for a little bit. And now he's back in Jerusalem. Now, the last time that Jesus was in Jerusalem, it was for the Feast of Passover back in chapter 2. Now, it doesn't tell us what feast he's celebrating this time, but most Bible commentators and scholars that I looked at believe it was more than likely the next Passover feast. It didn't necessarily have to be that one. It could have been the Feast of Lights or Tabernacles or whatever. <clears throat> but if it was the Feast of Passover, that would mean that it had been one year since chapter 2, the events of chapter 2. So one year has passed. And it's significant to note that because the last time Jesus was in Jerusalem, he stirred up some stuff, <laughs> cleansed out the temple, and then he taught the people and did signs and wonders. And so now he's back in town. And if the religious leaders and citizens of Jerusalem thought that Jesus had stirred things up before, he's got a little something for him this time as well. So let's look at the first few verses together. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which, in, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first av after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. And so this whole scene that we see here in chapter 5 is taking place at this pool of Bethesda. And it's interesting to note that, and this is no uh, great newsflash for you guys, but the Bible has come under much criticism over the uh, centuries. Uh, they'll see the, the people, the places, the names, and events of where things have happened, and they'll say, well, we haven't found any evidence of this, so these things didn't happen. And the Gospel of John specifically came under that type of criticism, especially in the 17 and 1800s, because they said, we've excavated Jerusalem, there's no pool of Bethesda, until 1888 when they found it. <laughs> and it was actually, you can go there today, it's in the Church of St. Maria, and it's actually two twin pools, very deep, they sit together, and there's the pillars all around and the five porches on each side. You can literally go and see it now. Kind of cool, because we dig in the dirt, and we find out that the Bible's true. And it's interesting, because... In archaeology, there has never been an archaeological discovery that has ever disproved anything in the Bible. In fact, it's actually the opposite of that. The more we dig in the dirt, the more the Bible is proved. So kind of cool, God's word is true, and we can rest on that. So um, just a little side note. You guys can Google all that, by the way, if you want. <clears throat> but here we have at this pool, there's a great multitude of sick and hurting people hanging out at this pool. And any time in the New Testament you see that phrase, great multitude, it's usually referencing hundreds, possibly even thousands of people. And so this is a very heartbreaking, kind of tragic scene that we see being described before us because you have all these people who are hurting and full of disease or, or they have some sort of physical ailment and there, there's this local phenomenon taking place. And so we see in, in verse, at the end of verse 3 and verse 4 this bizarre uh, description of an angel coming and stirring up the waters. Now, some of your Bibles, the end of verse 3 and verse 4 might be italicized or it might not be there at all because it was not in the earliest manuscripts. Just looking for panic. God's word's true. Don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. What they did is they added it later for clarification because what the man says to Jesus later on would make no sense at all if we didn't have some background information here of what these people were actually waiting for, hoping to have happen. Now, as far as this actual event, this could very well have been an actual event that took place. You know, there's a lot of things in God's word that are kind of spectacular, miraculous, that we don't have a great explanation for. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility at all that there's an actual angel that came and stirred up the waters, and the first person who got in was healed. Or it very likely could have been just an urban myth that had 
something had happened at one time years ago, and so a myth began to, to, to spread, rumor began to spread, and, and this whole like urban legend began to take root in the people that, hey, this water's magical, and we don't know anything about that, right? In our culture, urban myths, like rumors, gossip, things, people believing things that aren't really true, right? That doesn't happen at all in our day. So, but whatever the case is, you see a, bun- a bunch of people who are filled with desperation, the kind of desperation that sickness and illness and the fear and reality of death hanging over them brings to a person. And they'll cling to any hope, even if it's false hope. You have all these people hoping, praying that this, this, this event, this miracle, this, this legend is true, so that the next time the waters are stirred, if they can just get in first, they might be cured. <clears throat> Talk about troubled waters. <laughs> so we see in verse 5, a certain man who was there had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. <clears throat> and so here in verse 5, we have the sick man. He has been suffering with this ailment for 38 years, longer than Jesus has been alive. But we can kind of deduce a few things from the text here that, one, we know based on the text that this was an infirmity that he was not born with. So at one, at one point he was good, and then something happened, and now for 38 years he has been in this condition. And we can also see that based on this, what we see here in this text, that it's some sort of physical handicap, paralysis of some kind. It's limiting his movement dramatically to where he can't get into the water. You know, and it's not like he's going against world class athletes. He's going against a bunch of really sick and hurting people. So he's in pretty bad, bad shape. But in verse 6, we see that Jesus, and I love this, he saw him and he knew him. As we've been going through the Gospel of John together up in Homer, one of the things that we've been noting as we've been going through this together is that Jesus was very deliberate and intentional in everything that he did. This was not an accident. Jesus wasn't just wandering around the Jerusalem marketplace looking for a date shop. Date shop, not... Anyway. So, (laughs) that was bad. But it wasn't like he's just wandering around, checking in the sights, and then he wandered upon the pool. He's like, oh, sick people, and oh, let me find someone... This was a deliberate seeking out of the Lord for this man. Everything that Jesus did, every word that he spoke, every action that he took, as he tells us later on in the Gospel of John, was given to him by the Father, and he did not do anything on earth that was not part of the Father's will for him. And so what I love about that is as intentional and deliberate as Jesus was in seeking out this man, so so it is for you and I this morning. Jesus is very deliberate and intentional in seeking us out as well. And so he approaches this man in a desperate state. I mean, just imagine being in in this state of of hopelessness for 38 years and and with the love and compassion that only Jesus can bring, asks him this question, this seemingly obvious question. And and actually, if you look at it, it almost seems like a cruel question. Could you imagine if a couple of us, after service, we went to St. Luke's to the cancer ward and we found a young woman who was fighting for her life with cancer and we put our hand on her shoulder and we said, Do you want to be made well? No! Cancer's awesome. I love all the poison that they dump in my body, and the food's great, too. Of course I want to be made well. Why would you ask a question like that to somebody who is suffering? Why would Jesus ask this question? Well, like everything Jesus did and said, there was a very direct purpose in it and a lesson in it as well for you and I. Because the tragedy of the human race is that for millions of people, the answer to this question would be, no, I don't. Because there are so many people who do not want to be made well. And the thing that we need to understand and that we have to understand about God this morning is that he's not a dictator. He is not going to force his healing. He is not going to force himself. He is not going to force salvation or redemption or relationship on anyone who doesn't want it. Jesus said this very clearly in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. 
this whole idea, this whole concept is one of the most important truths concerning the gospel and the hope that we have in Jesus. God has declared himself to us in a spectacular fashion. Through creation, through his written word, and through the demonstration of who he is and the love that he has for us in his son and through the cross. As it tells us in Romans chapter 5, when God says emphatically, I demonstrated my love for you in that when you were sinners, when you hated me, when you were my enemy, when you spit in my face, wanted nothing to do with me, and were nailing me to the cross, I loved you this much. That's when I climbed up on the cross for you. And the demonstration of love that Jesus presented to us is such a powerful demonstration, it screams out for eternity, and no human being will ever be able to deny or doubt the intention and desire of God for you and I because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so God has declared, this is who I am. This is what I have done for you. Now you come to me. And that idea unnerves us a little bit. Whoa. <laughs> it makes us a little bit uncomfortable. But we cannot de deny as we look at God's word that this is within the sovereign will of God, the design that he placed upon our redemption, this is how he designed it to be. That we have to respond to him. We have to want it. And so Jesus asks this man a question that is all about desire. And his response in verse 7 is heartbreaking and sad and pathetic. Because he responds not with desire, but with his ability. Lord, I, I tried. I can't, I can't get in. Those lepers, are, they're fast. And the blind, they can't see, but they hear the water and they get in quick. I can't, no one will take me down. No one will get me into the water. I, I've tried. I've gotten as close as I can, but I just can't get in quick enough. <clears throat> and what screamed out to me so clearly as I read through this is just how often I've had this conversation with the Lord in my own life. And my struggles with sin, my struggles with wrong attitudes, wrong mindsets, my struggles with circumstances. Lord, I, I, I've tried. I, I've tried to stop doing this. I've tried to stop thinking that way. I've tried to stop taking that. I've, I've tried to stop looking at this. And every time I try, I, I just end up right back where I'm at. I fail, and I, and, every and I just keep failing. I'm tired of trying, and I just I want to give up. I can't try anymore. And we use the same reasoning in coming to God at all because we make a mess of things. We mess up our lives. We think we've got we to gotta make it up somehow. We've got to make amends. We've got to clean ourselves up so that we can come to God, and, and he'll approve of us. Guys, that's not the gospel. We sang it this morning, come as you are. God doesn't clean the fish before he catches them. He cleans them after he catches them. That was a little Homer reference. Okay, not in Homer anymore. <laughs> they would have got that up there. <clears throat> I believe the prodigal son illustrates this for us perfectly. You guys know the story. I know you do, but you have this young man. He's growing up in his father's house and doing his father's work, and he just decides one day, you know what? I don't want to be in my father's house anymore. I don't want to do my father's work anymore. I want to chase my own dreams. I want to experience the world. So he goes to his father. He says, I want what's mine, and I, I want to go. And the father says, okay, go. Chase your dreams. Experience the world. And so he goes out, and what happens? He lives it up, man. He has the, the Vegas nightlife. He, he's fast women, fast friends, fast money, high experiences. He's, he's having it all until the money's gone. Then the women are gone, and friends are gone, and the experiences are gone, and he's left with nothing and no one. He ends up in a pigsty literally starving to death, eating what the pigs are eating, cloaked in failure. Literally the stench of his failure is all about him. And it's in that condition, in that state of desperation, that he thinks to himself, maybe I could go back. The servants in my father's house, they're, they're not as bad off as this. And I, I know I can't go back as a son, but maybe I, I can go back and, and dad would let me work as a servant. And so he, he heads down the road, literally reeking of his failure, head down, full of shame, guilt, regret. And how does the father respond? He runs out to greet him, right? He's almost to him. He's like, oh, jeez. Okay, I was going to hug you. I was going to receive you. But we need some dial. We need some Irish spring up on here before I can give you a hug. Is that what happened? He smothered him in kisses, embraced him, threw the robe around him, put the ring on his finger, killed, 
Sally Cow in the backyard and threw a barbecue for his son. That is how the Father responds to us when we come to him. But we have to want it. If you guys don't hear anything else that comes out of my mouth this morning, please, brothers and sisters in the Lord, understand this. God is not interested in your ability. He's interested in your desire. So Jesus, in verse 8, says to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. I love the Lord. He cracks me up. Our king is awesome. <laughs> he completely ignores the man's excuse. Doesn't even give it the time of day and then just immediately gives him an impossible command. A command that he has absolutely no power to accomplish in of himself at all. A command that demands that faith be exercised. And there was something about Jesus, and this is what I love, there was something about the way Jesus looked, or there was something about the way he said what he said. There was something about Jesus that inspired within this man a measure of faith. And Jesus says, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could tell the butte to pick itself up and throw itself in the Pacific, and it would. And so the whole point of that is not about how much faith you have, it's about who your faith is in. And so whatever amount of faith this man was able to muster, because there was something about Jesus, and maybe you can relate to that this morning, there's something about Jesus that inspires faith within us. And so we take that small measure, however much it is, and we put it in him, and then through that measure of faith, the desire to take a step of obedience. And I don't know what he did. Maybe he tried to wiggle his fingers or, or move his foot. But once that measure of faith inspired a step of obedience, the power of God was unleashed in his life to accomplish the impossible. I think the application is pretty clear for you and I this morning. Jesus will never command you and I to do something that he will not give us the power to accomplish. And what's amazing about that to me is that means for you and I this morning that there's nothing impossible going on in our lives, no matter how impossible it might seem, that Jesus can't reach into and bring redemption to. Through faith and a willingness to obey, a broken marriage, a fractured relationship, an addiction that you've struggled against for years and you don't think you can escape, a situation that's left you feeling trapped and hopeless, you're confused, you don't know what to do, you don't know how to get out of it. Jesus has an answer. But he has a question first. Do you want to be made well? And if you say yes to that, <laughs> then he makes a statement, a command, pick up your bed and walk. Now this is a command, but it's a command of repentance. Pick up your bed and walk. <clears throat> Move away. Go in a different direction. Turn around. And by the way, don't leave your mat on the ground. Pick up your, your mat and go away from this place. See, so often we want to give Jesus a trial. You know, we're going to try him out a little bit. We're going to leave our mat on the ground just in case, you know, the, the Jesus thing doesn't stick. We can go back to the mat, right? Because the man could have got up and been like, okay, I can move now. I'm going to leave my mat here, though, because if I pick up my mat, those lepers and blind people, they're going to take my spot real fast. So this is my backup plan. I'm going to keep this here. And I'll try this out, but if it doesn't stick, i got to fall back. And so often we have the same mindset toward the Lord. Do you want to be free from alcohol? Yes, Lord, I want to be made well. Pick up your mat. Stop eating at the sports bar and grill and eat your lunch at Subway. Do you want to be free from that porn addiction? Pick up your mat. Throw that computer away. Go to bed with your wife. Stop staying up late hours alone. You want to get out of that situation, you need wisdom, pick up your mat. Ask for your help. Humble yourself. Seek counsel. Stop saying, this is just the way I am, and start asking God to change your heart and your attitude and your mindset. See what God will do in your life if you'll pick up your mat. Leave no provision to go back 
to what you had before. Paul said in the epistles, make no provision for the flesh, but we can't make provision for, as Christians for failure. Oh, we'll try this. We'll, we'll go to church. We'll see how the whole church thing, church vibe, but, but I got my fallback plan. I got my fallback buddies. You know, I, I, I can go back to this if this doesn't work out. If we make provision for failure, failure is what we're going to experience. This is a, a command to repent. You say, Lord, I, I want to be made well. I don't want to go this way anymore. And so he says, okay, rise up. Take up your bed and walk. Don't go back. Don't have a plan B. Don't have a, an escape hatch. All your eggs in Jesus' basket. So verse 10, this man is cured. <laughs> the Jews therefore said to him who is cured, it's the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And so here we see the interrogation. <laughs> This blows me away. At least they're focused on what matters, right? I mean, a guy healed 38 years, but they got him for the speeding ticket. I, hey, you can't take your bed. You can't. That's against the law. <clears throat> Completely missing the joy of the Lord and what had just been accomplished because of their religion. And this is, of course, one of the biggest dangers of religion. And not real religion, which is to love God and to love each other and to serve each other in love. But this man-made, religious traditions, rule-following, structured, this is what we have to do to be approved of by God. This is what we do to be superior to everyone else. Misses the heart and the intention of God completely. You know, it's crazy because the Sabbath was instituted by God so that we could enjoy Him. So that we could take a day just to celebrate the goodness and the majesty of God. To sing songs to Him, to meditate on Him. To not toil and, and work, but just, just, to just soak Him in. And so what did we do? The, we took the, that whole thing and we built 39 rules and restrictions around it. So you had to work to rest. Get up on Sunday morning, man, I'm exhausted from resting. You could, I mean, if you spit in the ground and it till, turns the dirt over, they'd say you violated the Sabbath. You tilled the soil. Can't answer the phone on Saturday in Jerusalem because you completed an electrical circuit. Consider that work. Crazy what we'll do in the name of religion, and we think that it's getting us closer to God, and we're missing his heart completely. But what it does do, and what it is effective at doing, is it's effective at completely sapping and robbing the joy of the Lord from any person. We see this happen all the time within Christianity, within the body of, of Christ. Satan loves to attack us in this area. We experience the joy of the Lord. Jesus does something in our lives. We're just like, I mean, could you imagine the joy this man must have been feeling? The, the thanksgiving, the exuberance. I mean, he's probably doing cartwheels through the temple. Who knows? And then here come the, the parade rainer guys. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't wear those clothes. You can't sing those songs. You can't, you can't talk to those people. Well, I'm just I'm excited. Jesus, oh, when you've been walking with Jesus as long as I have, what, so I can be grumpy and faithless and joyless and ineffective like you? No, thank you. I don't want to live that kind of Christian life. <clears throat> Guys, can we please not be this type of Christian where we rob and steal the joy of the Lord from others? <clears throat> A body that gets distracted on what we're here to do and here to be, start focusing on all the crap that doesn't matter. Probably not allowed to say that at the pulpit, but I just did. <laughs> and Satan loves it. He loves it when he can get our eyes off of Jesus, when he can get our eyes off of the joy of the Lord and get us focused on each other, get us focused on the stuff that's not going right, get us focused on the drama. And we just begin to implode inwardly. And you know what happens? We become a dead church. Zero impact for the gospel. 
Jesus warned the church in Ephesus of this in Revelation chapter 2 when he said, you're doing all these things and that's awesome, but you've lost your first love. And so what was the solution? What was the remedy? Repent. Go back and do the first works again. And what are the first works? The joy of the Lord is the first work of salvation. To be stoked about Jesus, to be blown out of your mind about the fact that Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, reached into our wrecked, ruined, and wretched lives and rescued us from the pit of sin and death. And you know what, guys? We are allowed to be excited about that. We're allowed to be pumped up about that. We're allowed to raise our hands and worship about that and say, hallelujah, Jesus, you are awesome. And I'm excited today that I'm saved and redeemed and born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's okay to be excited about Jesus and to not let our joy in the Lord be taken from us by a bunch of junk that doesn't matter, individually and as a body as well. And so Jesus finds him in the temple and he says to him, hey, you've been made well. Awesome. Stop sinning. Or you're going to end up worse off than when I found you. And the implication here is kind of sobering because evidently this man's ailment was brought upon him by something that he did. Now, when someone's sick or they're struggling with an illness or disease, it's not always because of sin in their life, but it is sometimes. It's important as Christians that we don't assume that, but it's also important that we understand that that very well can happen in our own lives. If you drink like a fish every day of your life, you're going to get dialysis of the liver. You get high on something one night and you're driving down the road and you wrap your car around the telephone pole and you're paralyzed from the waist down, it's because of what you did, the actions that you took. And so Jesus says, you know, this man needed something more than just a physical healing. He needed a spiritual awakening, a spiritual revival as well, a healing that took place in his heart so that he wouldn't return back to the old way. And this is probably, as a pastor and just as a Christian, probably one of the most tragic things that you witness. Someone comes in and they're excited about God, they're excited about what Jesus is doing, and they get a little taste, but then Satan is is so dutiful to snatch that seed before it's able to take root. And something, and whatever it is, maybe it's the the Pharisees coming and saying, ah, and and, and that freaks them out, and and they run back. Or it's the fact that they left their mat on the floor. And, and, and so Satan's able to tempt them back to that old lifestyle. But whatever it is, they go back to that old life, to that old way, to that old habit, to that old mindset. And so often they end up worse off than when they came to church in the first place. And those are the truly heartbreaking situations. And all you can do in that is just pray that somehow that brokenness will take place again and they'll, they'll come back. Because you... You know, it's just like the prodigal, you can always come back. But if we don't hear that call from the Lord to pick up our mat and walk, we're always leaving provision to fall back into something that God wants us to walk away from. And so as we close <laughs> this morning, a little application for our lives probably would be good. The Lord Jesus is here this morning to offer life and healing to everyone in this room this morning. But he's going to ask you a question first. Do you want to be made well? Everybody's situation this morning is different. You know, whether it's that broken relationship or it's that situation that has overwhelmed you or that addiction that you've struggled against for years. Jesus is asking you this morning, do you want to be made well? Now understand something. If you're saying yes to that this morning, if you're sitting there this morning and you're saying in your heart, yes, Lord, I want to be made well, I promise you the impossible command is right on the heels of that because he's going to tell you to rise, pick up your bed, and walk. And so you're going to have to trust him, and you're going to have to want it. He's not asking you to try harder. He's not asking you to put forth another effort. He's saying, do you want it? Because if you do, and you're willing to put your faith in him and your trust in him, then the impossible command that he'll give you, he will absolutely give you the power to accomplish. You want to be a better husband? 
pick up your bed and walk. Jesus will say, love your wife as I love the church. That's the impossible command. Want to be a better wife? Respect your husband. Impossible command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Put others' needs ahead of your own. Guys, these are all impossible commands that the Lord gives us when we tell him that we want to be made well, and he comes to us, he says, okay, now this is what I want you to do. But we have to do something? It's impossible without him, but with him we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. A measure of faith put in him, not in, not in religion, not in Christianity, not in the church, the measure of faith in your heart this morning that you will put in Christ and he will give you the power to experience his victory in your life. The power of God will absolutely be unleashed, but you have to want to. <laughs> you have to want it. A lot of times we're afraid to say yes to the Lord because in the back of our mind we have some inclination of what that might mean for our lives. Because God has proven through observation or through personal experience that when we say yes to him, he does stuff. <laughs> he moves. Things happen. And that can be terrifying sometimes. And that can hold us back from saying yes to that question. Do you want to be made well? Do you want it? I know that that was the case for me for years concerning Alaska. I was terrified to say yes to the Lord about that, as many of you can attest to. <laughs> and yet when we finally got to that point together, Kathy and I saying, okay, you know what? We need to say yes to the Lord. We want to be in his will. We don't want to say no to God in this. We want to experience what God has for us moving forward. And so we're like, yes, Lord, we want it. We want, we want your will. And so we thought that the hard part, the difficult part, was going to be getting to Alaska. Like, how's God going to get us there? It's 3,000 miles. It's, like, it's going to cost all this money. And, and so we're just like, is God going to do it? How's he going to do it? And, and then God just did miracles and got us up there. And it was just like, and, and you guys love us so much, and, and, and you guys said so many amazing, loving things to us, but all of it was nonsense about the whole, like, oh, they're going to love you so much, and they don't know what a gift you are, and you're going to go up there, they're just going to fall down at your feet, and we love Jesus, and this church was just going to spawn out of nowhere. And I, we, like, rebuked that, kind of, but in our flesh, we're like, yeah, that could happen. No, they didn't give a rip that we were there. They didn't care. They, didn't, they still don't. <laughs> and getting up there was the easiest part of this whole thing that God has put before us. And I have to be honest with you guys, <clears throat> when we got up there, we had no idea how dark and hard and hopeless it was going to be. And to be even more honest with you guys, I went up there and my mat was still here in Emmett. And when we got up there and we saw that the world that we were in and the mentality that we were in and the, and the attitude that we were in was nothing that we expected. So far to the left of what we expected that we didn't even know which way to look. And nothing was happening. And I despaired. I mean, I did. I, I went into the deepest depression I've ever experienced as a human being. And I just wanted to come home. I just wanted to come back. And I knew, like in my heart that God had called us up there, but I didn't care anymore. I didn't want it. I just wanted, all I could think about is what I'd lost. All I could think about was all of you, the relationships that we had, the ministry that God let us be a part of, the impact that we were seeing God make, and I just wanted to, I just, and, and I, even if I couldn't come back to the way it was, at least we could still be around it. At least we could still see something, some resemblance of hope, some resemblance of, of something godly. And so I slipped deeper and deeper into this pit, and my wife watched it, and she grieved, and she began to pray, thank goodness. And then the Lord spoke to my heart through my wife, and I hate it when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> but she said something to me that I'll never forget. She said, we ha you have to rise up and walk in what God's called us to do. Because if you want to go home, I'm on board. Let's go home. But we gotta, we gotta, we gotta walk in what the Lord. We've gotta let that go. And specifically, the Lord spoke to my heart. You gotta pick up your mat. As much as I love you guys, 
all, all my heart, I love you guys. I had to pick up my mat and move forward and rise up in what the Lord had called us to do in Emmett. And I knew that in that moment. And so my wife and I, we repented because that was the thing, the impossible. Because we didn't know what to do. I mean, all we saw was the hopelessness of the spiritual black hole that was consuming us, and we had no idea how to pierce through that. But we made a decision that night in January. We're going to repent, and we're going to ask the Lord to move us forward in what he's called us to do. And so since that moment, little, little by little, <laughs> we began to see God break through. We began to see God move. We were able to get the church started in May. We had our first public service on May 31st. We had like 15 people. The first time we were so excited, but six of them were the mans. But that's okay. We counted them anyway. Yes. And we were stoked. And I think since that, we, you know, going through the summer, we've had um, about a month ago, we had 22 people, and we were all excited. But then the and then the next week, we had six. And then the next week, we had 10. And last week, we had 15. I, I joked with Mike. I called him last night to pray with him. I said, you're going to have 30 people tomorrow. <laughs> Freaked him out a little bit. <laughs> but we see God move. And, and, you know, the Lord, he began to move us forward. We, he began to excite us. He began to put a passion in our hearts for being there. And, and then specifically speak to my heart about vision, about who's there to reach. And, and that was hard because, you know, the, the culture... Oh, well, I need a mic. <laughs> we didn't really know how to reach those people, and so the Lord in June brought another kind of revival to our heart, and he confirmed what he was speaking to Kathy and I about who were there, how to reach out to them. And it was exciting because we're like, this is, this is awesome. We have no idea how to do this. There's no common ground, but they'll respond to Jesus. And I found out when we were up there that for the last five or six decades, there have been so many church plants in that area. People have come in and they've planted their flag and they've gotten their Alaska and they see the hopelessness of it, the vacuum of it, and they've hightailed it out of there. And so we literally had to tell me, I, I had a conversation with people where they say, oh, you're the new guy, the, the new Calvary Chapel. And, oh, yeah, there's been other Calvary Chapels. You'll be gone in a year. I'm like, whoa. That was the common sentiment. And so I went to Kathy and I said, honey, we're going to have to be here three years before they even open their ears, before they even give us the time of day. And she kind of smiled and I smiled and I was like, that's okay. We'll be here in three years. And so God has infused us with vision. He's, in, he's, he's given us a, a hope and we're, and we're starting to see break through the darkness. And we're like a dog. When someone's response, we're like, oh, I'm afraid we're going to overwhelm them because we're just like, ah! <clears throat> but we're seeing things happen, and it's awesome to see what God is doing. Your prayers have been a huge part of that. Please continue to pray for us. Pray for Mike and Lindsay because they're still in the first three months of the shock of it all. But, you know, it, it came down to, for us, you know, we had to make up our mind if, if we wanted to walk in what the Lord wanted us to walk in. We had to answer the question, you know, do you want to be made well? And so this morning, guys, I plead with you, let God ask that question to your life this morning. Whatever it is, do you want to be made well? And then know that the impossible command will come after that. But if you put your trust in Jesus, watch the power of God be unleashed in your life. Not just individually, guys, but as a body as well. You know, it's, it's interesting now having an outside perspective. Because you guys see all the... Actually, what this is all about. But I can't by what God is with this body and the impact that this ministry is having on this town. Don't let the enemy distract you and pull you away from what you're here to do. To love God, to love each other, to be made well as a church family so that you can have an awesome impact for the gospel in this town. Let's pray.